from BQE Restaurant and Lounge in the heart of Atlanta's historic Martin Luther King District, it's Newsmakers Live, bringing you the issues, politics, and perspective of the Atlanta community. Now in its 10th season, here is tonight's moderator and your host, eight-time Emmy Award-winning broadcast journalist, Mr. Maynard Eaton. My partner Jim Welcome is not with us tonight. Um, we have Mr. David doing good. Um, so there won't be a closing commentary, but there won't be one needed. Um, I've been covering news in this town since 1978. I have been two of the most iconic figures in Atlanta's history. Uh, Atlanta's known for its great black preachers from Martin Luther King Jr. to Jasper Williams to Reverend Mc, uh, McDonald. You can go on and on and on about Atlanta's iconic and, and, and civil rights legends in terms of the, the pulpit. But these are two of the best. They're probably the top two. To my right is Dr. Gerald Durley, who is considered the dean of Atlanta's black preachers. I mean, you, you talk about black preachers in Atlanta, he's the first name that comes up. And there's nobody that surpasses the living legend, Dr. C.T. Vivian, a Medal of Honor, Medal of Freedom winner, an aide to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and a civil rights hero. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. We come to talk about a little bit about politics and the, and the, and the impact and power of the black church on politics. Uh, it's always been a factor. I guess in 2017, will the black church and the black parishioners of their churches and respective churches around the, around the city still be the determining factor in the outcome of this mayor's race? Dr. It, I'll it, let him start. It, it, uh, in fact, uh, you're going to turn uh, it up. In our history, is the black church Put up the has line. been the core of politics. And uh, which way they went made the difference. And it's only the size of the city that made a difference. So the black church does resonate. The black church does have a say-so in the outcome. Always has. And, uh, uh, and all year long, uh, the major ministers of that community uh, are making decisions too on who to watch and who not to watch. Dr. Durley, your take on that? You've been watching, you've been listening and interviewing pastors, I mean, uh, candidates. Uh, first of all, thank you for allowing us to come and share uh, this afternoon on something I think is very critical. Uh, in a nation that's being divided on race, gender, sexual orientation, political way. So the church where black people attend, you call it the black church, I just call it the church where black people attend because the church doesn't have a real color. But uh, what's interesting now is that it is so divided and the strength, CT was saying that at one time you could come in talked to the black, black pastor, and we had the kind of influence. Uh, we gather more on Sunday mornings, but the influence that we once had is not as strong as it once had because there's a new kind of millennial, there's a new kind of person coming in, whereas before, uh, we had the, we could tell someone where to go, where not to go, what to do, and now there's a much more challenge. We still have the numbers, but how we influence those numbers is somewhat challenging. Uh, in today's world, very challenging because and there's so many conflicts. See, we didn't have to compete with uh, Atlanta Housewives. Right. We didn't have to compete with uh, all of the right. uh, latest nuances on social media. We could say it on a Sunday or a Wednesday night, but now all the intervening variables are very tough. Used to be a time also, right down the street, Butter Street Y, you and you and Jesse Hill and some other major businessmen, like Brad Hubbard's in the audience, would sit down and say, here's what we want. Now we have, what, six, five or six black candidates running uh, for a, a, out of the eight candidates. Um, that time is over when you and other influencers could decide who runs and tell the next one to wait their turn. Is that correct? That, that's correct. At one time we could come together. At one time we had, we could pull a large voting population just from the housing projects. Right. Those have been dissipated now. And we could come together and agree on candidates. But now, at one time, and I think CT can speak to it much more adroitly than I, 
And that was is that two things made the civil rights people and those working, the ability to sacrifice and risk. Now people don't want to sacrifice anything or risk anything. So when somebody says that they're going to run for mayor, you've got a lot of egomaniacal individuals say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. So when the pastors, we sit around or other civil rights leaders, they don't, they don't, they don't listen as much because they have an agenda and they feel that they, it's their right at this time. Whereas before we could sit down and, and negotiate. Yeah, well, the, the, the real point is, is that they who act like they're going to talk for the people generally today are not talking for the people. Uh, talking for themselves. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, and the larger the city, the more that's the truth, right? Uh, and, uh, and when we look at uh, uh, who has the real influence uh, in a major city, the historic churches still do. Uh, 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 there are those who talk in the room around and so forth. But the community, is, uh, where the community money goes and uh, where the most influential of, of, of the voices in the total community go is still uh, in the hands of uh, a very few but the historic churches that have something to say. Will those, church, those churches, those choice churches, uh, have an influence on who becomes mayor this time around? Can they pick a winner? Well, uh, when it comes to this time around, uh, uh, probably not as much as we think. How, however, uh, or, uh, uh, nobody really knows how influential influential is. <laughs> How influential, influential it is. Yeah, that's right. You're, you're always the wordsmith, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Durley, speaking of influential, you were amongst uh, other pastors, Reverend McDonald, some others, who met at uh, Lindsay Street Baptist Church uh, a few weeks ago to interview all the mayoral candidates, uh, uh, as I recall. We've not heard anything from that, that, that get together. Well, first. You told us something about to happen. Yeah, but first of all, we, we wanted to look at all the mayoral candidates. But equally as important, you just can't look at the top spot. When you look at this year's political situation, the person who was chair of the city council is stepping down. The person who was Fulton County is stepping down. School board president is stepping, uh, his time is up. There are two or three people on the city council. So we've got to look at the infrastructure that will support that top office. In the past, we could sit down and see two things. Who is electable and who has the best need for the citizens of Atlanta that best meets the, uh, our position. So consequently, when we came together, we devised, uh, a group of us came together and we devised a survey. Uh -huh. And we asked six primary questions and we sent it to them. First of all, we've got to be concerned about gentrification here in the city of Atlanta. I mean, over in Vine City and, and uh, uh, Adams Park and off of Metropolitan Deal, these houses at one time were 60, 65, they're going for $250,000 now. In the black community. In the black community. Uh, well, and what's what it was. What it was, and it's, and it's changing drastically. All around Cascade is changing. So consequently, we want to look at gentrification. We want to look at education. We've got to look at the difference between charter schools and public schools and what does that really mean in terms of getting our children educated. We've got to look at access to public health, major criteria. These are three questions. We're looking at the environment. The climate change, global warming, the hurricanes are nothing new, but we've got to be concerned about that because it negatively disproportionately impacts us. Then we've got to look at police brutality and the justice system. Those are the kinds of things that we need to look at in this city, city since all politics are local. So we sent all the candidates a survey and just in your own words give a 250 per point response to those. We, get, we have those back now. So you have, And we've talked to them, we've interviewed them, and now we, we saw who, we've seen who's qualified. So now we're going through now and we'll be meeting to look at how this matrix thing will help those that we're called to serve. Is it true you're down to three candidates you will choose between? Well, it's, that's not true yet. We, we're not down not to any yet. particular <laughs> number, no. <laughs> that's not true yet. <laughs> What's on the lips of everybody in this, in this race is the question, are we looking at our last black mayor? Are we looking at our first white mayor? 
Dr. Vivian, you've been in the civil rights movement since it began. Is race a factor? Should race be a factor? Always, uh, it's going to be a factor, right? and it and it should be, and it must be, uh, uh, because uh, we know who we are and we know who we serve, and and because we do, we have to look out for it, and we always do. Uh, uh, that's 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 not an issue uh, with with ninety percent of us. So uh, uh, that makes. That makes the real difference, right? Is that uh, we not only will have to make the difference, we will have to make certain that no matter what we do and who does it, all right, they have got to be able to deliver for our people. And this is the thing that we have to look at, uh, uh, is that uh, can they really deliver, uh, de deliver for, our, for, for our people? Well, the critics might argue that some black mayors in the past, maybe the one in the most recent past, but some say black mayors have not always delivered for black folks. Well, they've always tried, though. Dr. Durley, is that a burning issue amongst the, amongst the past? When, when you come, black, it's, 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 it's a, it, we have a new dynamic. We've got a post-millennial group who did not go through many of the things that CTE uh, and I had gone through, the kind of segregation, uh, the kind of black, white. They look beyond that in many instances. They're looking to somebody, I'm talking about those in their 30s and 40s, who can deliver trash collection, who can do those six things that we ask about. And they believe that skin don't necessarily mean kin. And uh, so consequently, they're asking the question, can this person do it? And to be very candid, I was very surprised when so many of them are talking about Mary Norwood and what Mary Norwood is doing. She's a ubiquitous person. She's everywhere. But as CT has said, that there's something that we've got to educate and then hold those that we educate uh, accountable. There should be some kind of semblance of if we have the, you never hear a Jewish person saying, well, I don't know if we're going to go with the Jewish person or Latino. That's not an issue. But we get into that, and so now with this next voting generation and those who put their money up to support vote, they're, they're asking the question, will we get the services that we want? And so we've got, to, we've got a, a conditioning thing that we've got to show that there should be some semblance that if, you, if we put you in, you have an account, you, you owe us something. That's politics. I heard a young black family man, young guy, uh, he was working with Peter Amon, another white candidate, who said, Maynard, we've had black mayors ever since I've been born, but the bluff is still the same. He said, what is a color, skin color, skin color done for those of us who live in the bluff? That's hard to answer that. It, yeah, it, no, it, it, it's, it's a challenging question. That's why I think, as I said, everything, not only are the demographic changes, over there where I am on the Cascade area, it's changing drastically. Where I went to, I couldn't believe down on Florida Avenue and U Street in D.C. I went to Howard School of Divinity, and that was all black. It's all white now. So consequently, it's interesting that it's, uh, it's going so, so strange that a lot of the white candidates are voting in black candidates, a lot of white people. So we've got to look at what are the dynamics and then begin to educate the message. Who are the people that can deliver the services? So when you say the bluff still looks like that, what were the etiological factors? What were the things that were involved in that? And we got to, right now when, uh, like for example, now I won't call any names, but the fifth district congressman, for years he's been in there, people said, what has he done? The fifth district still looks the same. But a lot of other kinds of things for political things, maybe national, so what we've got to do now is, if we before we put somebody in, and we've tried to do it in the past, before we put somebody, hold them accountable. These are the kinds of things that we expect, and then hold them accountable. Now, whether that was done in the past, we've all attempted it, and I, I think we could have done a better job. And every election, and every election has to do that, uh, and every election has, in one way or the other, and or they or the person who was who was voted on doesn't, will not end up with influence after the election is over, all right? Uh, because they, they have no, no way to express it, all right? You, uh, uh, they have to be able to express it before they go in order to be able to express it 
after they get there. Oh, we had a turning point in Atlanta. We had a pivotal point where Atlanta's changing either ethically or in terms of housing patterns. Is this a new day? Are we approaching a new day, a new dawn for Atlanta? Uh, uh, well, not new. Uh, you know, there's nothing really totally new. But, as, uh, and this is why you asked the question, right? Uh, because you're, you're thinking about years of politics that uh, is still the base for uh, our activities, all right? Uh, they may not be the same, but uh, uh, if you can't produce what you have been producing, you will not be important. And, and, uh, uh, and you can't continue to uh, uh, make anything happen that uh, uh, makes a difference. Atlanta's at, at, at a very critical point, and it's a sleeping point. Uh, sleeping? A, a sleeping yeah. point because you see, very in a very subliminal kind of way, Atlanta is shifting in its power struggle struggle right now. We don't know who's going to be the next chair of the Fulton County School Board right. President, yeah. where schools are located. The financial basis begin. The economic base has always been on North Side. Or that is that still going to be in control? So we're losing. At one time we had perceived political power right. because we had the mayorship, we had the chief of police. The, look at the chief of police now even. Right. Very quietly and all of a sudden we'll wake up and say, what happened to the biggest county? How did we, as a color, per, person of color, how did we lose that? It's very quietly. It's like, the, remember the old frog in the tea kettle? You put the frog in and the frog is smiling and you turn it up one degree and the frog is still smiling. You turn it up another degree and the frog is still smiling. Turn up two more degrees and you got frog soup. <laughs> the frog is dead, but didn't know because it was so, it was so comfortable. And we now, at one thing, we were not comfortable when we would see things, but now it'll be all right. It'll work itself out. On the national scene, we are not on the national scene. Korea, the wall, Latinos, gay, lesbian, everybody, but not the voting. So we're in that, that, that kind of period that we have to almost restructure to say, how do we hold those that we put in power uh, 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 account? And right now, Atlanta is in that very quietly shifting mode. But, uh, uh, and, and this isn't the first time we've been in a shifting mode, as, as Rev calls it, is that, uh, uh, and, but, it, but it won't remain the same, all right? It, it's, uh, how, how do you handle what you have? How, uh, uh, how, how much hard work do you get done uh, for, for week by week? at least month by month, all right? Be, because if you don't get it done, you won't be back anyway, all right? Or you'll make a good front for the wrong people. I just, I was just talking to a, um, an author of a book about public defenders. And in his book, he says, I asked him point blank, I said, do you think, he, he talked about the first wave of black mayors and what they did and did not do with regard to crime and the drug war. And I asked him, I said, do you think black uh, first wave of black mayors misfired or made mistakes? He said, definitely. Yeah. And, he, and he quoted saying that, that we were, they were echoing what the white establishment was echoing. Had black mayors failed in their response to the black constituents, generally? I don't think so. Is that uh, uh, when you say failed, uh, they've always been there and they have continuously worked at it, right? Now, there are some that have not, but uh, that doesn't make the mass of them. And it doesn't, and it doesn't mean the mass of the black voter of public uh, uh, that they represent is that uh, uh, those who get voted for will make the difference in the end. To me, failures when Anybody can make a mistake. When you go into a new situation, black man, new by black power, the presence of power, failure to me is after you've made a mistake, you don't correct it, and you don't get up. It's no, it's no, it's nothing wrong with making a mistake or failing, or even making a mistake on budgetary items where you shift things or making certain selection around those around you. It's when you don't correct those things and try to make a difference, that's when you fail. Um, we got to say that we've all failed and fallen short of the glory. 
But every now and then, when you, when you do make a mistake, surround yourself with those. And that's what this generation now is asking. It, it, we're not just going to vote for you because you're black. Mm -mm, that era is over. But we want to give you the shadow of a doubt. And will you, it will even forgive you, but we were a lot more tolerant. The generation today is not as tolerant as we were. We give a person a break. No more. That era, because they came up. They came up in, in those kinds of schools and post-education right. where they move like this. You, they're not going to come to church and sit for two hours and hear about a pastor's appreciation. They want to come in, park, hear the word, and get out. That's their life. So, but so now it's a, and it's, so that same psychological thing is the same in politics. Are you going to do the job? What did you promise to do? Have you done it? How much will it cost? I'm with you or I'm not with you. Point blank. Do either of the two of you have any favorites in this race? Uh, Caesar Mitchell's name is mentioned a lot. Keisha Caesar Wilson. Mitchell is my favorite. Your favorite, I thought. Yeah, and, uh, and when we talk about a favorite, I think that we have to really talk about it in such a way that we know what their vote is going to be, where it's going to be, and how hard they're going to work at it, right? See? You and, uh, you and, and Ambassador, you don't have to endorse Caesar Mitchell. Yeah. Why? Be, because uh, he's the best thing that we got out there. And we already have uh, put uh, a great number of people behind him, all right, to be with him, to make certain, well, as we say, to make certain that the work gets done, right? But we already have uh, 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 rather several hundred people already behind the people that we're talking about. Right. Is it, do you have a favorite instance? As I said, we're, we're looking at, and I think looking at all of the candidates at this point, and uh, in the next uh, several weeks we're going to narrow down, predicated upon what they said they would do, <clears throat> when they said they would do it, do they have a grasp of what the people that we represent really want? Then one of the things that we're certain about is that at that point we're going to collectively make a uh, a determination and not only put our mouth behind it but put our influence and put our dollars and heretofore because in any group of people you have some that are more favorable toward one person another person but then how do we look what is the in our estimation the most appropriate most electable candidate who can meet our needs and and that's what we're looking at now now I might have a personal preference but I'm, I'm with I've learned the one thing whenever you're you've been Think you're a leader, you've got to be a good follower. So I'm working with my colleagues on that. Finally, to each of you, um, two separate questions. One, speaking of this turnover at City Hall, uh, from City Council, City Council President, Mayor, Fulton County, there's those who speculate, who, who fear, that we're in for some major indictments at City Hall, a City Hall scandal. Does that concern you that we are? Uh, We've been uh, pay to play stuff and kickbacks may uh, unravel or may come forth in some indictments. Is that? That always bothers me. Any kind of, I spend my life, and, and so is CT, and we uh, have always talked about the honesty, the integrity, particularly when it comes to the public you know, domain, where people are being shortchanged, where people are being disenfranchised, not only financially, but health wise. All of those things, and whatever these indictments, I've heard about in October, the big surprise. Yeah. I'm convinced that whatever the big surprise is, no surprise. <laughs> Somebody's already been surprised, and they know, so it's a lot. So I don't know all the ins and outs, but anytime there's any kind of shenanigans going on like that, we're going to try to stand on the side of righteousness. There is concern, though, is there? No, but there's a strong concern. There's a concern if this does come out that we've got to look at that uh, and make a decision uh, very objectively and not back those that have already done some things uh, in the dark because they will come out in the light. And at that time, then we have a responsibility to those who trust us. But right now, even from the pulpits, uh, we have to be very careful because our trust level, I saw an article the other day that most pastors are, they had a list of professions and number five on the people that didn't trust was a used car salesman. Number six were preachers. We were behind a used car salesman in terms of selling something. And I said, have we dropped that low behind a used car salesman? You know, so, so now it's more important that we speak the truth and hear the truth and share it back with our people. See? It, 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 it's, still, uh, it's still a matter of uh, who, was in, uh, who was changing uh, what part of the, uh, uh, the, the, the situation that we were 
going to uh, respond to. Uh, uh, it's still the matter of, uh, of, of what, how, how much hard work have you put in, all right? Uh, how many things have you done? Uh, it's still how much uh, uh, are you going to be certain of prior to the election as well as before the election? Let me talk about putting in hard work. Yeah. You put in hard work in the Civil Rights Movement. You and Dr. King, uh, Dr. Abernathy's son is here. Yeah. Uh, you put in hard work. Yeah. Um, Charlottesville it was just recently. Uh, we were talking about Confederate Monuments. Charlottesville. 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 What I'm asking, are you disappointed that all the work you've done, things still remain the same if that works? Well, the fact they, they the haven't same. remained they the haven't. same. And that's, that's the thing that's important. It, it's easy to say they remain the same. They haven't remained the same at all. In fact, uh, uh, there's at each level, uh, there is a different set of people even, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and we have made so much change that uh, uh, the total community has responded in a way that they did not two years ago, five years ago. No, I was going to say, I mean, you have to respect a man like this. Uh, he started really in 1946 in Peoria before there was a civil, there's always been a civil rights movement all the way back to Frederick Douglass. He, he became the movement. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and he came over when Dr. King brought him, you know, and uh, I, I, I look at that now. Do you realize this man is articulating these kinds of virtues? Listen to me, at 93 years old, that's how long he, somebody ought to give an applause to that. At 93 years of age. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I see people get in the movement and spend 93 minutes, <laughs> you know, not willing to sacrifice and, and risk. And I look back, when I look back, I, I started in the movement in 50, I was 75 years old last week. So when we go back and the time, finishing high school in 50, I'll be 76 next week. And so when you look back, it's the sustainability. Uh, That's it. I hear that a lot of people, and I, I don't know whether you're going to get to this, but you might, a lot of people now are really bashing Andrew Young. When I met Andy, he was, he was 28, I was 18. And, uh, and bash it, but how many people do you know, this is not actually, that can stay on the battlefield constantly, national, local, international, and still try to hold that banner of speaking up for people. You get weary, you get tired, but now what happens, people quit. They walk away. It takes a lot of tenacity to stay in there and some days you're on the right side, and some days you're on the wrong side, and some days you don't know where you are. But you know you stay there, and that's the kind of, how do we pass that on to this generation? How do you, you know, I don't believe anybody, uh, when it comes to the torch, you don't pass the torch, you take the torch. That's it, Doc. I'm giving the Boy, torch to somebody. True. You don't, don't, you ain't nobody don't pass the torch. The Underground Railroad, what's her name did the Underground Railroad? Uh, uh, who gave, who gave her the torch? She took the torch and took a gun to your head and said, move. So we, you know, I was trying to pass the torch on to a brother. Nobody asked me who lit the torch. Don't matter who lit the torch, carry the torch. Who, where, who lit the torch? Where the torch going? So we've got to say, now let's take that torch. But when you come up to somebody and say, we got a meeting tonight about something, they say they got a frat meeting. Right. Or they got a meeting with the 100 black women. Or they got a meeting. Where is the priority? Where is the sacrifice? You take it again. If my mother got in my way during the movement, I said, Mama, sit down twice, and then I just got to go. That's the power that we had at one time. Yeah. The commitment and the compassion, the double C. Finally, Dr. Uh, your last word, sir. Oh, last word? Okay. I, said, I don't want to keep you on that. Is that, is that the important thing is, let's deal with Andy just a moment before sure. we have it, right? Uh, <laughs> Please. Because, because Andy and I, he has been controversial. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, of course. But if you really look at it, only in the last few weeks has he become that controversial. All right? Is that uh, because he said something in the newspaper that somebody didn't like and they talked it to somebody else, right? They didn't even read it, right? All right? Because had they, they would have understood that the depth of his thought was beyond of what they normally run into. Uh, Andy has been there for a long, long time. Andy has thought through 
everything that he has said and done. That is not easy, right? Is that uh, uh, because because what Andy says every now and then, every now and then, does not fit what what a half dozen people want, or or they can uh, they can talk. Uh, uh, and he says it well when he says it. Yeah, it's not yeah. he's stumbling over himself. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, see, but but uh, uh, it seems as though, right? But when you think it through, Andy is always very thoughtful, and uh, he always gets back in uh, where you didn't expect him, right? Because he has thought things through, and Andy's the most thoughtful of people that we really got around, right? Even when he went with Yasser Arafat against Jimmy Carter. That's right. He didn't. He was saying years ago the Palestinians, if we're going to go with the PLO and move into Israel and all that, he was dealing with that so much so that his man Carter had to let him go. But but what he <laughs> talked about even then came to be: you've got to deal with the Palestinian issues there in Israel and a, a, a two-city state, you know, there in Jerusalem. He was saying that then, and they rose up against him. So, and any time you're out there, I always say if everything is coming your way, you're in the wrong lane. And Black so, pastors still will make decisions though with regard to their choice for mayor in a few weeks, you say. I, I didn't hear what you said. Black pastors will make a, their decision with regard to who they, they support for mayor. I think in the next several weeks there's going to be a, a, a strong a backing from, from the clergy community about who we think would be possibly the most electable person and one that we feel can really meet the needs of, of our constituents, those we're called to serve. Dr. Gerald Durley. Dr. C.T. will be two icons. Ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for two of the greats in our community. Two of the greats. I'm fucking getting off from down here, but as he was saying, this has been newsmaking. <laughs>